I met this, I'm, the object that I'm going to introduce to you today, I met long after I left school, even after I graduated from uni and did a mathematics degree, I still didn't know that this thing existed. And then I found out about it and my brain just shattered into a million pieces. And I kind of think, because I know a lot of you, for a, a significant number of you, despite the fact that this is the class it is, a significant number of you will never do maths again after this class is over. Um, at, least in a, at least in a formal sense. And so I, I view it as an immense tragedy that um, you never get to meet this. But it takes some work to get there, which is why you're not supposed to know it, because it's outside the scope of the course. It's outside the scope of any interesting course, in fact. Okay? So, it's built upon an idea that we sort of meet in extension two, but I want all of you to know it. So this lesson kind of has three acts. The first act is we're going to look at in very, very, just the bare details, which everyone can get of the idea in extension two, which is built on. Okay. Then we're going to build a second idea, which is not even in extension two. So that'll be new ground for everyone. And then the third act is I'm going to show you what this idea is. Okay. Now, I should also point out, this is often called the most beautiful formula um, in this is one of the reasons why I'm so keen to show it to you um, in all of the like because this is what math is you you know how like on like BuzzFeed there's like top 10 top 10 oh, yeah. fight scenes in Marvel movies or top 10 you know chick or whatever right so oh, people people always there's this like innate human desire to come up with like top 10 lists right now on top 10 lists for mathematical formulas this one without exception universally it's always at the top, every time. But I kind of think the word formula is a bit of a misnomer. When I think of formula, it's kind of like, here's a set of steps you do to get something out the other end. Right? Like, there's a formula for the area of a circle, right? It's like, well, if you put this in, you get this out, okay? This is not a formula, it's an identity. It's a relationship between things that, that form two sides of an equation, okay? So if you haven't already, make this heading and then just Get ready to engage your mind, okay? Because we're going to go some difficult places, but I promise it will be worth it, okay? Like I said, my intention is for everyone in this room, um, regardless of how much maths I've been doing in the last two years, to understand this, okay? So I'm going to go right back to the beginning, okay? All mathematics in every culture throughout history, no matter where you are geographically, it always starts with the same idea, which is counting, right? Um, even very, very young children have this, I, this concept of counting, so it's fairly sort of fundamental to the way we work and the way we sort of understand and interpret the reality around us, okay? So you start with counting, but as soon as you ha develop counting, it's fairly intuitive to, to move on from there to addition, right? Like addition is actually, it begins just kind of as an extension of counting, right? You plus one, plus one, plus one, and then you're like, well, why can't I add bigger numbers than that, right? So we could write something like, oh, I don't know, 11 plus six equals 17. So addition comes out naturally. And then as soon as you have addition, you have subtraction, right? So you can put things onto a pile and you can take them away, and that's what subtraction is, right? So we can write something like five take away three equals two. Now, despite how, how little of a distance we have gone in terms of like mathematical concepts, okay? Counting and addition are incredibly free things. There are no rules really for counting and addition. You can count anything you like. In fact, that's one of the most things, the most amazing things about counting that, you know, little kids when they're like, what's the biggest number you can think of? And they're like, oh, 100. And you're like, 101, right? And you, you can keep on blowing up people's minds. There's no rules to do with what you can and can't count. And it's the same with addition, right? But the second you hit subtraction, this is the first moment when suddenly you will give something to a, a child and they'll say, oh, you can't do that, right? For instance, you can't do this, right? If you give this to a young enough child, you say, what's three take away five? They'll say, you can't do that. That's their response, right? Think, it's not that crazy. I know it's been a long time since you thought that, but why can't you do three take away five? Three. Yeah, there are only three objects there. Right? You know, three objects there. I have, I know what five take away three means. It means you have five things, and then you take away three of them, so that's what you get left with, right? But if you reverse it, you're like, well, I've got three things, and then I take away one, then I take away two, then I take away three, and there are no more things to take away. 
okay? So when they say, you can't do that, what we really mean is, I can't imagine a number that would be a meaningful, sensible answer to this question, right? I don't have that number in my head. And then eventually we learn, actually you can imagine a whole family of numbers, a whole category of numbers, that's the answer to a question like this, right? And we call them negative numbers. And we say, okay, well, if you include these with the other ones, we call them integers, etc. okay? Now, all the way through, as we progress through mathematical concepts, we encounter problems like this, right? So this kind of problem, right? I might phrase it slightly differently. I might phrase it in terms of like an equation you have to solve, okay? So if I said to you, um, x plus 3 equals 0, right? Like, try and tell me the number that if you add 3 to it, you'll get 0, okay? Trying to solve this equation sort of necessitates, okay, I need something called negative numbers, right? And I don't want you to, um, I don't want you to miss, negative numbers were a crazy idea for centuries. People were like, well, you can't measure them, right? It's like, this table can be this by this, but you can't say it's negative this, or I can't have negative cows or whatever, right? It doesn't make sense in accounting scheme. But this isn't the only time that this kind of thing has happened, that we've had to imagine a new way of, of thinking about numbers because of a kind of problem we've tried to solve. For instance, here's another one. If you went to an ancient Greek, right, they would have said, well, you can't do that. You can't do that. Because there's no number they could imagine that would be a suitable solution to this equation, right? They would think to, of fractions till they were blue in the face and no fraction will do it, right? No fraction will do it. And so they said, well, if there are no numbers that are rational, that are a ratio between two things, we need to imagine a new family, a new category of numbers, and we call them irrational numbers. Right? Now I should say, just like with negative numbers, that these numbers were considered just nonsensical for centuries, right? And that is why the word irrational literally in our language means nonsensical. When you say, stop being irrational, right? It's, it's a holdover from the time when this idea, like, we know this means not ratio. You can't write it as a ratio, right? Um, the square root of five, okay? It's a third. We have a whole, a whole new category of things for this, right? But because it was such a crazy idea, this word, which means not a ratio, came to mean it doesn't make sense, okay? Now, this has happened many more times, but the time I'm most interested in for an equation is this guy. Okay, you can add negatives, you can have irrational numbers, but no negative numbers, no rational numbers will solve this equation. We, don't, we can't imagine this concept, right, of what kind of number would be a suitable, meaningful equation to this, right? And I've been dropping the word imagine on purpose because the category of numbers that we fashioned, invented, are called imaginary numbers. Again, I'm getting sick of hearing this probably, this is a derogatory term, right? Which was fashioned by the people who opposed the idea of this and they said, these numbers aren't real. Where are they in nature? Where can you find these? At least I can talk about these as like, you know, backwards and forwards, or I can think about these on like, on the hypotenuse of a, of a right angle triangle. Where are you gonna find these, huh? Go look, go look for them and tell me where they are. They're not real. And so they were called imaginary numbers because you can't measure them, you can't see them, all that kind of thing. Okay? Now, this particular equation is important because it's kind of like the building block of all of these. If I gave you x squared plus 3 or x squared plus 5 or x squared plus anything, all of them would be a version of this one, just bigger or smaller. Okay? If we went ahead and solved this, let's get this down with me. You should have all three of these, really. If I take this x squared plus 1, right? It's like, well, just do the normal thing that you would do when you're solving an equation like this. Use all of your algebraic manipulation skills. You'd say, well, I want the x's on their own. So I'll get all the constants out of the way. And you're like, well, I, I guess I take the square root of both sides now, right? And this is the point at which we say, oh, you can't do that, right? Year 9 and 10 and even 2 unit extension 1, u says you can't do that. But, but what if you could? Right? So we call this guy, we say um, that the square root of negative 1, we give this a name, we call it, after the name, right? we call it i. Okay? Um, every square root of a negative number, like say the square root of negative 5, right? or the square root of negative 16, they're just multiples of i. Right? Do you get that? Like for example, if I said the square root of negative 16, we can use some, um, we can use some operations here to separate this out. This is root 16 times root negative 1. Do you agree? 
right? So that's four times the square root of negative one. So that's four i, okay? So this is just kind of like your basic building block. You don't need new names for all of these guys if they're all just bigger and smaller versions of the square root of negative one, okay? All right, so here's this idea of, of you can't do that. Well, well, what if you could, okay? Now we call these guys imaginary numbers if you put them together with the numbers you're already familiar with, these negative numbers, irrational numbers, etc., they're actually kind of like oil and water. Right? They don't quite mix together. They stay as the real part, like these guys over here. And then there's this imaginary part, which it's almost like algebra. It's like, well, they're not like terms, so you can't just put them together, right? But you can still work with them together, right? Even though, like, say, 2x plus 3y to the 7, right? This is a standard binomial we've looked at before. Now, these are x's and y's. They're not going to mix together, but they can still interact when you go ahead and do the binomial expansion. As long as you keep them in their separate sort of compartments, but it's still one binomial. Does that make sense? So if you put together an imaginary number with a normal number that you think of, real numbers, we call them complex numbers because, like, well, it's, it's, it's more complicated. There's more facets to it than all of these um, simple numbers here. Okay? So, probably worth writing down. <clears throat> if you take an imaginary number, and then you add it to a real number, these are all the numbers that you've been dealing with before these guys, then we call that a complex number. Okay? 